Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, we've arrived at a crucial inflection point in K-12 education because of COVID-19. You know, the pandemic has forced a change in instructional strategies and as such presents an opportunity for schools and districts to identify evidence-based programs that will help support um, uh, growth and impact for their students. It's also a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to truly innovate uh, and we must seize this moment uh, to really generate and gather uh, data on the programs that are being created because of COVID-19. And if we do this right, we can both mitigate unfinished learning due to the pandemic and make some headway on reducing pervasive and systemic disparities that exist in our education system. And so internationally, uh, there's a growing convergence around high impact tutoring uh, to support youth uh, this is due in large part to the research um, by the University of Chicago Urban Education Labs. And, to and today we're going to learn a little bit more about the recent data on the efficacy of high impact tutoring and how Saga Education and what we're doing specifically to scale high impact tutoring and, and to codify and disseminate best practices uh, broadly. And so before introducing our first keynote speaker, I would like to thank um, our, the sponsors for this event for, uh, for supporting this webinar. I'd like to personally thank John Gurian, Lenz, uh, Jens Ludwig, uh, Rosanna Ander, Monica Bott, and many others at the University of Chicago for helping us understand our impact. And I'd like uh, uh, to extend a, a special thank you to Chicago Public Schools in the, city, uh, in the city of Chicago for truly being a pioneer in leveraging rigorous evaluations to understand what works and to, uh, um, to help inform policy. And none of this would be possible without your partnership. So now it's my pleasure to introduce John King, uh, who's the president and CEO of the Education Trust and former uh, U.S. Secretary of Education, who's going to share some opening remarks. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to connect with us today, Secretary King. Thanks so much, AJ, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this conversation. Look, as we reflect on this past year, we have to acknowledge as a country that despite heroic efforts by principals and teachers, uh, this has been a really challenging experience for kids and families. Uh, and disproportionately, that has been true for low-income students and students of color. Uh, low-income communities, communities of color have experienced a disproportionate impact of the health consequences of COVID, the economic consequences of COVID, and the education experience of the last year has been an equity disaster. Uh, we know that many students who were uh, shifted to online or hybrid learning because of valid public health reasons, uh, didn't have the tools they needed. Too many students didn't have reliable internet access. Too many students didn't have access to devices. Um, we know that these were pre-existing inequities. Uh, we had a digital divide before COVID, uh, but now that digital divide has meant students not even able to log in to school or participate regularly in their classes. We know that families were differently positioned in how much support they could provide to their children around learning at home. Uh, only about one in five African-Americans in the workforce can work from home. Only about one in six Latinos in the workforce can work from home. Many kids uh, were with an older sibling or home on their own. Many kids had to work during this period because of the economic crisis. Um, so all of those challenges, plus districts not necessarily having the resources to support their teachers around professional development and technology tools, all of that has meant uh, real challenges for students. Uh, McKinsey projects as much as six to 12 months of lost learning in mathematics, particularly for students of color. Uh, we've seen very high rates of chronic absenteeism in Boston. Uh, a recent report showed that 40% of 11th and 12th graders were chronically absent. In Montgomery County, Maryland, where I live, uh, we see in the grades that students are getting. We had a six-fold increase in failure rates in freshman English in our district. So these challenges are real, but there is a solution. And the solution is uh, to address kids' academic and socio-emotional needs to respond with what the evidence tells us works. Um, high dosage tutoring or targeted intensive tutoring has a long evidence base. When you have tutors matched to students with proper training and support, uh, they can help students make rapid progress. Expanded learning time, 
providing kids who have fallen behind with more time in the summer and after school, we know can make a difference if it's high quality, if the educators who are working with students are well-trained and well-supported. And we know that relationships have to be centered. Uh, I was a kid who, in, when I was a kid in New York City public schools, I lost both my parents. My mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. The thing that saved me was positive relationships with wonderful New York City public school teachers and great learning experiences at school that allowed me to be a kid when I couldn't be a kid at home. I'm excited about the conversation today because Saga is doing exactly what we know works and what the evidence tells us will work, providing that intensive targeted tutoring in the context of strong positive mentoring relationships. And we're gonna hear more about that today as we hear about this research, which is showing that we can actually help students make very rapid progress, help students catch up, avoid uh, the risk of a lost generation of students because of the impact of COVID-19. Victor King, thank you so much uh, for those remarks and for joining us today. I want to thank all of the, of the charitable foundations that have uh, joined Saga over the years and are co-sponsors of this event. Thank Whiteboard Advisors for their exemplary work. I should also note uh, that we have uh, people from every time zone in this country. We have a minister in the government of the Netherlands. We have uh, individuals in Perth, Australia. So in effect, this is a worldwide webinar uh, because the world is interested in making a difference for kids here in this global pandemic. So I have the honor of introducing uh, Latanya McDade now. Uh, Latanya um, has a terrific career as a leader in the Chicago Public Schools. She's currently the Chief Education Officer of CPS, the third largest district in this country. Before that was a principal, before that was a teacher, and I think before that she's so proud she was a product of the K-12 Chicago Public School system. The other thing I'd say about Latanya, we've known her for a, a number of years. Every time we meet, every time she visits the school, what she wants to know is what do the kids think of what's going on? What is the voice of the kids? She is uh, always uh, seeking that answer and finding truth and wisdom in that answer. Latanya, Chief McDade, welcome to our webinar. All right. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Alan. Um, and I'm really excited to be joining, uh, be joining you here today. Um, any chance that I have to gather with professionals from both UFC and Saga is an opportunity I definitely would not miss. Um, both of you, both Saga and University of Chicago have just been outstanding partners to Chicago Public Schools over the years. And both have really supported our use of data to shape best practices and really drive um, student growth. We've long as a district believed that evidence-based research can and should be used to influence policy decisions. Um, but, you know, we honestly could not do this work without our external partners. Um, we have an unprecedented relationship with University of Chicago. Um, our Freshman on Track initiative is a perfect example and really aligns tightly to the work that SAGA is doing. Um, with our Freshman on Track, it's a, it's a transformative program that came about through our district's unique relationship with University of Chicago. And we've been working with U of C for nearly three decades now. And the research and data that they've provided has had a significant impact on our methods. 10 years ago, we just, U of C discovered a substantial connection between how a student performs in ninth grade and the likelihood that they would graduate from high school on time. And with this data in hand, CPS created what we call freshman on track. And that's the system that we use to track the progress of our ninth graders and then intervene if we begin to see them falling behind. Freshman on track has really helped us to move from a graduation rate. And I want you to really think about this. Just 10 years ago, barely 50% of our students were graduating from high school. And fast forward to today, we're at an all-time high rate of 82.5% of our students graduating. So that's um, over a 10-year period moving from barely 50% to 82.5%, and that's, that's significant. Um, and so when we think about our partnership with Saga, which has also played really a key role in keeping our ninth grade students on track. Um, and I know this firsthand, as Alan mentioned, you know, I took the time to visit classrooms, to talk to students, to ask about their experience, to see the work that they are doing. And what I saw is a really unique blend of innovations that targets our most vulnerable students and their focus on putting ninth graders on the path 
it aligns directly to our work with keeping freshmen on track. By embedding math tutoring into students' daily experience and then introducing them to engaged, intelligent fellows who are really invested in their success, it is uh, tremendous for us as a district to see how Saga is transforming the experience of our high school freshmen. Saga tutors build a communication bridge between each student, their teachers, and parents, ensuring that the right people and the right resources are supporting the unique needs of every child. And the data shows that this intervention often results in better attendance and rising grades. And that's not just in math, but in subjects across the board for students who participate in the Saga program. It show, the research also shows that students who participate in the Saga program for one year show improved test scores in math by the equivalent of an extra two to two and a half years of learning, which is nothing to sneeze at. Saga students have been shown to outperform their control group counterparts by almost one full letter grade in math. And Saga has succeeded in narrowing the achievement gap in math among students of color by 50%. A lot of the work that we're doing in the district right now, we've had uh, incredible, the, over the past decade, we've had tremendous progress academically as a district. Um, and Saga is a part of that journey and has made significant contributions to the academic progress that our students are making every day. These results are remarkable. But I know that Saga is not content with this success. And so today we have new research to explore research on the potential impact of intensive tutoring. Um, as we heard John King talk about the, the impact of intensive tutoring and the importance of it, I could not think of a better time for this kind of research to um, be made available when I think about what's happening with our students here in CPS, um, because we've experienced, uh, like school districts across the country, um, this has been a school year like no other. And although you know, we finally have opened the majority of our schools for a hybrid in-person learning model, um, for nearly a, a year, all of our students were learning exclusively from home. Our teachers, our administrators, it's been a Herculean effort and they've done everything possible to provide our children with a quality remote learning experience. But nothing can replace the student experience in person in the classroom. And as we begin to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and as the immediate danger of the pan pandemic begins to subside, there's an aftermath for education that's becoming very clear. And we are entering into what I call an educational crisis. There is a tremendous amount of unfinished learning that will need to be addressed in our schools. And there will be many ideas and approaches on how to tackle this challenge. Um, and in CPS, we definitely will be looking to trusted partners like U of C and Saga Education to support us in this work. We know that the work that Saga is doing works. We know that intensive tutoring works. And so I'm excited to hear more about the research that's been happening in this area and really look forward to discussing how to create best practices around what I'm calling a once in a generation effort that is facing us in the months and even years to come as we get our students back on track um, and address unfinished learning in this district and quite frankly across this country. So I want to thank Saga Education for your incredible partnership. I want to thank U of C for your partnership. We simply cannot do this work alone and I'm really excited to have you as partners as we continue the journey ahead in supporting every single student in CPS. Chief McKay, thank you so much. One thing you said, um, you saw the unique blend of innovations. What I'm hoping with data driving us is that this is no longer a unique model in schools, but a, a universal piece of what kids' education consists of in public schools in this country. Not that Saga will run those programs. We can certainly support, support them, but this needs to be a universal aspect of education in our So um, please now to introduce our two um, main speakers here on the data presentation. These are. Um, to leaders of the urban labs of the University of Chicago. John Gurian, Dr. John Gurian is an economist, uh, Northwestern University professor of education and social policy and co-director of the education labs. 
His research interests include the causes and consequences of racial inequality, among other topics. Dr. Monica Bott is the Senior Research Director of the Education Lab and the Crime Lab at the University of Chicago. Her research interests include building capacity in educational systems and evaluating programs. And let me call on uh, Dr. Monica Bach to begin the presentation. Great, thank you, Alan, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, Secretary King and Chief McDade for your opening remarks. Uh, as Alan mentioned, um, my name is Monica Bott. I'm the Senior Research Director for the University of Chicago Education Lab. Um, and we are very excited to present this work, um, which has been done in partnership with the co-authors you see listed here, in addition to many, many others, um, some of whom are on this call that made this work possible. So as Secretary King alluded to, um, and Chief McData as well, we will learn a lot in the coming weeks, months, and years about the lasting effects that COVID-19 and the unique schooling uh, experience that it has led to for America's school children about what the effects will be for uh, our kids today. Uh, but one thing we know for sure is that pan pandemics tend to exacerbate inequities that existed prior. And in uh, American education, we have long grappled with stubborn, unyielding, persistent uh, disparities along the, along the lines of race and class. Um, that we have been trying to address for decades, if not longer. So what this graph shows is that the gap between students, um, for example, between uh, rich and poor students far outstrips that of what a high school student learns in math over the course of their entire high school career. So if we're going to be serious about addressing these persistent inequities, then we need to think deeply and carefully about how to do this so that some students are learning more than the average high schooler during their tenure in math and in other subjects as well, um, so that the red bar on the right might uh, be eliminated and even get down to zero. <clears throat> so uh, in order to think about what might be most helpful, imagine this scenario. You are a high school teacher um, and you are tasked with leading a classroom of 30 students. Some of your students might be working on problems that look a little bit like this, and don't worry, um, we're not going to make you solve for X here. Uh, but you might also have students in that exact same classroom who are still working very hard to understand problems that look more like this. And your job as a high school American educator in 45 minutes is to help support in a very, very detailed way, each of your 30 students, no matter if they are working on very complex pro, uh, problems of math that are more akin to college level math, or students who are still struggling with basic concepts that are more akin to fifth or sixth grade level math. In some ways that is an impossible task, and yet we have heroic high school teachers who wake up every day and do this not just once a day, but six or seven different times a day. Um, and I think that the innovation uh, that Saga Education's high dosage tutoring program had was to basically simplify the task that teachers might have, which is to say, it might seem obvious that providing students with a tutor is the best way to help them learn math. But what Saga has done is to figure out how to provide that tutoring um, to students at a at a cost that is palatable to school districts and at a scale um, that can include thousands of students at once um, and isn't so bespoke as to need um, you know, a, a, a particular or impossible level of resources to, to actualize. Um, the other thing that I wanna say about this model, which is the model that we studied for the results that I'm about to share, is that it is high dosage tutoring, which is to say that not all tutoring programs are created equal, and this is not once a week homework help. Um, the model of Saga's high dosage tutoring that we studied for which I'm gonna share effects on um, was once, a, uh, sorry, it was daily, uh, 45 minutes a day, um, students worked with a paid and trained tutor and students got uh, classroom credit for their math lab um, program, which is the class in which they worked with tutors, again, on a daily basis for four, 
45 minutes a day during the school day. Um, so that's a very, very different model than homework help, which I think is really important to keep in mind as we try to think about how to best utilize resources that are being made available for COVID relief and funding um, that might be applied to high dosage tutoring. What we find, and again, Chief McDade alluded to these results, um, what we find is that students gain an extra two to three times as much math learning in one year as a direct result of Saga's program. So we thought that this model was so promising um, that we studied it in partnership with Saga and Chicago Public Schools using a randomized control design trial, uh, a, tr a trial design over um, two years uh, with about 5,000 students over those two years. And what is, what's important about these findings is that because of the rigorous research design, we're able to attribute uh, these effects that we're seeing for kids who participated in Saga directly to uh, the program of high dosage tutoring. What you see is in the first year, in the first study, we see um, what I might call medium effects. Um, which is the first year that Saga was operating in Chicago Public Schools. And in the second year, we see really large effects um, in year two. But consistently, we see that kids who are participating in Saga are learning more math uh, than their peers, um, at least by measure as measured by standardized test scores. Importantly, we also find effects on other outcomes. Um, so we see about a 45% reduction in math course failures. Um, and interestingly, we find a 20% reduction in non-math course failures. Uh, so overall, we see about a half a letter grade increase um, in uh, math GPA, and we see increases in core course GPA as well. Um, we did a survey of kids who participated in Saga um, or who were offered the chance to participate and kids um, who got all of the other services that were available to them in the school and asked about questions um, of grit, locus of control, to try to understand what might be driving these effects. We do see that kids who participated in Saga uh, demonstrate higher levels of uh, self-efficacy in the sense that they are more likely to report that they are good at math, that they are good at school, that they like math. And we think that um, some of those results and that sense of self-efficacy that I can do this uh, is what is driving these very large results that we see. Um, and then finally, one other thing I want to point out is that sometimes uh, in social science and education, we might see very large program effects at the end of the year, at the end of the program. Um, and we're really excited about that, but the effects fade over time. We were interested in whether or not that was the case here. And what we find is that does not seem to be the case, which is to say when we look at 11th grade outcomes and 11th grade test scores for students who participated in Saga largely in ninth grade, um, so two years later, we see a 0.22 standard deviation increase in math test scores, which means that kids, even two years later, are still learning a year and a half more of math than their peers, um, which is to say that we don't find a lot of evidence of program fade out or put differently that the effects persist um, over time, even two years later. These findings are important when we look at the benefit cost ratio of Saga. So here we show the benefit um, cost ratio, not only of Saga education, but other uh, programs that have been rigorously studied and are largely known and popular in education research, specifically early childhood programs, um, which are often thought of as uh, high return on your investment um, avenues, uh, or put differently, they're always thought of as really good investments. Um, so there's sort of this uh, well-known uh, common ethos of if you invest in, you know, kids, that's, a, that's a going to yield um, much more benefit for the dollars that you put in. What we see here is that on average, Saga has a benefit cost ratio of four four to one. What that means is that for every dollar that a school district spends on Saga, we see four dollars of benefits in society that are generated. Um, and we think that this number could be as high as six dollars of benefits generated for every dollar spent. So we think this ratio could be six to one, um, which is uh, evidence that Saga Education's model of high dosage tutoring is um, 
just as cost effective as some early childhood interventions, if not more cost effective, turning on its head this idea that it is too late to intervene for uh, kids when they reach high school and when they get to adolescence. A lot of programs that we've studied in the past for high school students um, have yielded disappointing results. And uh, that has led to some pessimism to sort of think, oh, it's too late once kids are older uh, to intervene and to intervene successfully. I think what this research suggests is that uh, it's not that students are not able to um, learn and change and grow as they get older. It's that the model by which we are supporting them and doing that um, hasn't actually been you know, the right one until now, but we do think that high dosage tutoring um, is one model that has a lot of promise in terms of these solutions. Um, so we're pretty excited about these results, which are stunning on their own, but also because for the past few years, we have been working in partnership with Saga and Chicago Public Schools to understand um, whether and how you can get the cost to be even lower and still preserve effects, which allows you to serve even more students and still see these very, very large gains as a di direct result of programming. Um, so for context, the model that we study in the, in the paper was with two students working with one tutor, again, every day, 45 minutes a day, as part and parcel of their school day. Um, we recently studied a blended learning model in which there are four students working with one tutor and kids are spending half the time with the tutor and half the time on an online platform, which is about half the cost of the model we study in the paper. Um, and as a reminder, the model we study in the paper is uh, very cost effective. So a ratio on average of four to, you know, four to one. Um, and the results of the blended learning uh, model that I just described are very preliminary, but early indications suggest that the positive effects for students still hold. Um, and that's exciting because it means that this version um, that we are presenting here uh, is extremely cost effective. And if we are able to cut the cost in half, um, and we think we're able to preserve the benefits, that means that this blended learning model could be even more cost effective, which again is to say that you could serve more students and still realize and maintain those gains for the same um, dollar amounts. And again, as districts are, are thinking about um, the federal dollars and the COVID relief funding that is coming down the pipeline, you know, thinking about how to support students learning, um, you know, potentially to address learning loss, but also to keep continuing the work of uh, addressing some of the persistent disparities that we've seen in education research. Um, we thought that this was important information to share and to share with you. So thank you so much for your time and interest today. Um, I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Um, and we'll now hand it over to um, Alan to um, reflect on some of the work that we've been able to do together. Actually, it's over to AJ. AJ, you're on. Thank you so much, Monica and John. Uh, the results so far are, so, uh, are, are really encouraging, um, but it's really important for everyone to keep in mind as we, as we look at the data, I mean, we're talking about people, right? And these are amazing students, uh, all of which we are you know, extremely proud of. And so what we're gonna do right now, all of whom we're, we're extremely proud of, and, and what we're gonna do right now is play a brief one minute audio clip um, so you can hear directly from the students we, um, we serve in Chicago. Question then for you, what would you say was your favorite part about math class? Um, my favorite part, really, I really, I really can't say it, it was a favorite part, but it was a, a idea like the child was willing to work with me. The child took out time, our child day. Even though I ain't gonna lie, I'm not the easiest person to work with, because I know for a fact on my attitude is it's a mess. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> y'all took y'all time and it, it wasn't just about like you know y'all doing y'all job y'all took the time and day to really help out a kid that really need help that's how i look at it really because that's awesome. i ain't like i told my mom I, I can't be no dummy without no diploma i'm sorry i can't do it because i gotta want it for myself i can't 
everybody ain't home ain't gonna be here for everybody. Everybody can't do everything for me. So I gotta want it for myself. So that's one thing I can't say. I do appreciate y'all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, Deshana, well, I really appreciate you just answering that question for me. Um, and Child, it, it's like you too, like, out of bed, no step. I know in, in the morning, I never want to get up, but look, I got up. Right. You got it. You, you did what you needed to do, and now you got it done, and you're on your way. That's why I've seen y'all smelling y'all pictures. None of that y'all proud of me. That's me. you have to. Cause y'all, oh, yeah, yeah, totally understand it a lot, a lot more, a lot, lot more, and just, you know, just like being able to come here for help when I've done something, and like just having the, you know, help that I need. So that's what's helpful. And what I like about it. Is that, I mean, I don't know, like, I mean, everything about it is it's just amazing. I don't, know. I don't really know how to explain it. It's just a good experience to have for my last year. I wish I would have had it my junior year, my sophomore year. Oh. Um, this has been a, you know, a challenging school year for all of us, especially our students. And it's just really nice to reflect and, and to think about the good that's happening. Uh, and again, I'm really proud of, of the students we serve and really grateful for the opportunity uh, to walk alongside them on their academic journeys. Uh, so looking towards the future, um, you know, given the growing convergence around high impact uh, tutoring, it's essential for us to be um, very bold and strategic and thoughtful about the steps we're taking to increase our impact. And after months of conversation with key stakeholders uh, and our partners, we've identified three strategic anchors that will help us rise to this critical uh, occasion. Uh, direct support, uh, widespread impact, and systems change. When it comes to direct support, you know, we'll like to directly stand up and run our program in up to 15 new anchor cities within the next three years. And that's important for three reasons. First, you know, we want to continue to demonstrate that you can replicate this model in other contexts while maintaining uh, program effectiveness. The second piece is that these new locations will serve as training hubs and serve as talent pools for Saga Education and other organizations. And third, um, we're going to continue to test new cost-effective approaches and um, pro program permutations. When you think about policy change and systems change, we want to figure out and identify the levers we can pull on the state and federal level to encourage uh, the use of evidence-based programs and high-impact tutoring so that it's the norm and it's not the exception. And so if we, want to, if we don't capitalize on this growing interest now, we may miss out on the opportunity to push, to push for important changes. Uh, so we've developed a detailed policy brief which we expect to unveil over the next few weeks uh, over the next few weeks, and it's really coming from a practitioner's perspective and things that will help lift the field. And we're going to start the process of building a coalition to support that soon. And the last element, uh, widespread impact, uh, you know, supporting students directly is not enough, right? And even if Saga education to, could become 50x next year, it's a small drop in a really big pond, right? Especially if, if you think about the magnitude of the effects of COVID-19, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. And so we wanna be very mindful about what we are doing as an organization to help build the capacity of other organizations, schools, nonprofits, and others uh, to build out effective tutoring programs. And so our goal is to lift the field of high impact tutoring. And um, we're gonna do that in two ways. First, by creating a training portal on components of effective tutoring and sharing our technological tools broadly. And second, through light touch and hands-on consulting and technical support on different aspects of program implementation. And so widespread impact will allow us to, meet, uh, to reach many more students quickly, uh, even if, though there will be a, sh a short-term trade-off in breadth versus depth of impact. Uh, but over time, more organizations uh, will succeed at uh, coming up a learning curve on rigor, execution, and results, and will do so better and at faster rate because of this knowledge transfer. You know, last fall, we had the opportunity to integrate an ed tech company into Saga Education, Woot Math, which is based out of Colorado. 
And, and that was through the support of a, a number of philanthropic partners. So that organization, that team is now Saga Education, uh, which means developing high quality ed tech solutions is now a core competency of Saga Education. So I would like to introduce Krista Marks, who's our chief uh, product officer, who will walk through Saga Coach, which is an engaging self-paced uh, basic training portal on components of effective, tutor, of effective tutoring. Krista, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, AJ. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm going to just share my screen here. As school districts implement tutoring programs, a common challenge is hiring and training new tutors, many of whom may not be trained educators. And this is, of course, an area that Saga has developed deep expertise. With this in mind, Saga made the bold decision to develop Saga Coach a new online service that will provide basic training to new pre-service tutors. This interactive portal lets any new tutor get the benefit of Saga's basic training. We're really fortunate to have some of the nation's best designers and engineers working to ensure that Saga Coach is as engaging as it is effective, that it delivers a novel, immersive experience. Saga Coach is designed for any tutor working with K-12 students. It's a place for new tutors to learn the fundamentals of tutoring independent of greater subject. Saga Coach is a self-paced experience that tutors can access anytime, anywhere. This is actually a screenshot of Saga Coach's dashboard. When a new tutor logs in, they first see front and center their next module. And they can also choose different modules to dive into. Now, at the top of the dashboard, I want you to notice that from here, tutors can navigate to units, the reflections in progress, and to the larger community of tutors going through Saga's training. We think it's essential that our audience can do this training on the go, anywhere, anytime. And as part of this experience, tutors have agency over their journey through a suite of interactive modules. These modules cover three core topics that are central to tutoring effectively. These are the three R's. Relationships dives into a tutor's own educational journey and how it informs their practice. Ratio shines a light on what a high quality tutorial looks like. And rigor explores topics like lesson planning, analyzing student work, and more. This is a screenshot of the units portion of Saga Coach. And you can see the suite of modules first at the top relationships, then ratio, then rigor. This is where a pre-service tutor can preview and engage with those learning modules that make up Saga Coach's basic training course. It's such a pleasure to give you guys the very first glimpse of this important and exciting initiative. With that, let me hand it back to Alan. Thanks, Krista. So as we mentioned earlier, um, we have time for Q&A here. You could populate those in the Q&A section. And uh, what I'll do now is I'll, uh, I'll read out some of these questions and look for answers. So there was one question uh, earlier, it's a fundamental question, how do we define high dosage or as we call it high impact tutoring? Um, I guess I'll take that one. Um, we've done different models. We've done the model as low as 20 hours. It was a project with the college board. We've done a model uh, scheduled for about 90 hours, but the average uh, student in the, in the semester we did in New York received about 40 hours of, of tutoring. And we've done models where it's every day, so 180-day school year, 45-minute periods, about 135 hours. Then we come to the conclusion that uh, if you're building it into the school year, a 60-hour dosage is a very good target for a minimum, and the maximum would be the number of days in the year, a period per day. I think under 60 hours, you, you have some... Um, erosion of the ability of the tutor to build a relationship with students. That needs time, gets better over the course of the year. So 20 hours seemed quite minimal, although it was an interesting trial. We did an online trial before COVID, which also showed promising results, and that was just 20 hours. And the 40 hours actually received by kids in New York City in 2015 resulted in a 10 point uh, from pre-tutoring um, pre to post-tutoring gain on the New York Regents, ninth grade algebra Regents exam for the kids as tutorial. So there's Results that can occur, but we think the hours should, uh, targeted by the district should be at least 60 and uh, as high as every day for the year. Another question I think was asked and then answered, but perhaps only to the questioner. And Monica, you gave the answer, so if you'd, um, if you'd come off um, uh, mute and, and repeat it. The question was, do we have evidence of the program working for students with learning disabilities? Uh, Monica, you have an answer for that. 
Sure. So in each study year, about 15% of our um, study samples, so 750 kids total of the roughly 5,000 students that we um, worked with had a learning disability. And so we don't have a treatment effect just for those 750 kids, but they were, I would say, not an insignificant um, part of our study sample. Um, so put differently, uh, we tried to understand the effects of Saga for um, all incoming ninth graders in the partner high schools in which we worked. And we tried not to sort of um, cream or have really strong eligibility criteria that would preclude anyone from being part of this programming, if that's helpful. Got you. Um, Chief McDade, are you still on the call? I knew you had another meeting, but maybe you were able to put that out. There you are. The question came to Chief McDade, what advice would you give to other educators or decision makers who are open to implementing tutoring to address the missed learning due to COVID, but who may not know how to get started with selecting and implementing high quality tutoring? Yes, I, I think it's really important to um, do the homework, do the research about the different models um, here in CPS, spe specifically as it relates to SAGA, we have um, two different models. Some of our schools have a hybrid approach um, when it comes to tutoring. So I think it's important to do the homework and understand what models exist. And more importantly than that, when you start to think about um, high dosage tutoring, it's also important to have a screener in terms of how we identify students um, and that helps you to better understand what their needs are in selecting the right model. Thank you. A number of questions popping up here. Um, question, who are the tutors in the CPS program that was evaluated? How were they recruited and trained? AJ, do you want to talk about how uh, tutors uh, at Saga are recruited and uh, what we do for training? I don't know if everyone can see me or hear me, but uh, at Saga Education, we recruit primarily recent college graduates who are interested in a service year opportunity or gap year opportunity for, before pursuing graduate school um, or individuals who are looking for a ramp up opportunity into education or, or, or the nonprofit space. So about 80, 85% of our fellows are recent college graduates. And then the remaining you know, 10 to 15% are mid-career changers and retirees. So folks are just interested um, you know, who are retired may have a pension or looking for something meaningful uh, to do. And so we have a really robust uh, recruitment apparatus to screen and qualify candidates, um, you know, from starting from a resume review, a math assessment. Uh, there's an on, there's a, a, a sample tutorial where, where people um, have to reflect on their own performance and we can see how they can receive feedback. We also have a rigorous intensive training over the summer, roughly 80 hours of instruction. Uh, but you know, we don't create rock star tutors from our brief training academy. I think what ultimately allows our tutors to rise to become effective instructors is the ongoing coaching and feedback apparatus that we have built into our system. And so any organization that's thinking about implementing high impact tutoring, I think uh, what's really important is to think about what is it that you're going to do to help build out and support many individuals who could be rookie educators so that they can be successful throughout the year. And that's something Saga has really excelled at doing um, since the, the start of this work in 2004 while it was under the Mass Education umbrella. Um, and so the way in which we're able to do that is um, uh, because of the site director who manages a team of, of tutors. And that site director is responsible for giving daily and ongoing coaching and feedback and support to those tutors. And that site director is also responsible for collaborating with the school administration and teachers so we can align our curriculum with what, what's going on in the classroom, right? And that's, that's the value add of making tutoring a part of the academic ecosystem uh, for students is what you can have that alignment, ongoing communication and support um, with the school administration and staff. Thanks, AJ. Monica, you wanted to uh, comment specifically on how we, um, who were the tutors who were in the study itself? Uh, sure. So there are about 140 tutors who were um, providing the tutoring that we studied uh, in these two particular years um, for which I'm presenting results. They were um, about 50% of them um, were, you know, male versus female. About half of them were Black and Latinx um, in terms of uh, their racial demographics. And then um, we... Uh, had some kind of screening or, or Saga had um, some screening that AJ just talked about. Um, but we've also been doing some work in later years to think about um, 
how the specific qualities and characteristics of a tutor might be uh, affecting some of these treatment effects. The, the short answer is um, in this particular study that we're looking at, um, we think that there wasn't a huge difference between you know, the 140 tutors that were selected and you know, other tutors that could have been um, providing the services in their place. And uh, John Gorian, uh, related to that um, question is how do you control for the quality of tutors? I know you've done some thinking and some research on that question. Yeah, so, um, well, the research design is a randomized trial. So um, all the comparisons that Monica described were comparisons of kids who were randomly selected to be offered a chance to participate in the program as compared to uh, kids who were um, similar to them because they were randomly selected to be in the comparison group. So that helps us uh, make sure that we're making uh, fair comparisons in the outcomes of the kids who are in the program to other kids who are similar on average to them in all sorts of ways. Um, in terms of the controlling for the quality, of, I'll put that in quotes, of the tutors, um, I, I think it gets at what Monica was saying, which is that um, you know, the study that we reported the results from are from a study that was you know, showing the effectiveness of, the, of Saga being delivered by those 140 tutors. And you, know, you might be interested in what would happen if Saga were to try to hire 10 times as many or 20 times as many and try to expand access. Uh, would they be able to hire tutors that were, that were as effective? And we've been working on that with Saga and with CPS. And, you know, again, the preliminary results suggest that, that yes, Saga could um, expand their hiring pretty significantly. And be, I think in part because of the way the program is structured, um, there, are, there are a lot of people who, are, who could be very effective at this, um, at, at being a tutor and really help students. Thanks, John. Uh, another part of that question I'll take, uh, how long do the tutors stay on average with uh, students or schools? We ask for a 10 month school year commitment as we go out and recruit. Uh, and it turns out that people who are doing this work uh, fall into several categories, many of whom are taking a gap year between graduating from college and going on to professional school. Many others of whom are mid-career and, and thinking about what's next for them, some of whom want to go into teaching and want to ramp way to it, and that starts with tutoring. But 20 to 40 percent every year in every city we've ever been want to stay with us at least a second year. We have somebody in the sixth year. So it's interesting to recruit. We need to say, look, it's just one year because we pay about $15 an hour. It's a good salary for a service. It's good stipend for a service year. It's not a high paid job. It's people driven by a mission. But once they get in the job, and as Natanya and I talk about all the time, what do the kids say to them? What do the kids say about the program? They feel so nurtured by that experience and the relationship that they build with their kids and their families that 20 to 40% want to stay with us at least a second year. So that's the uh, that's the tenure we have, which does mean we have to go out and recruit every year. But every year, since I began this with Mike Goldstein back in 2004, we've had eight to 23 applicants for every position in every city. There's a pool of people out there who want to serve kids, and there really was no door open to that service uh, for, for people like the ones we're recruiting. Many of them might apply to Teach for America, become a teacher. There's really no other position in the school that fits the profile of the kind of people who want to do service. I think we opened a new door into public education for people to serve. And this time when I think people are thinking about serving and giving back to kids who have such interrupted learning, I think the pool of people interested in this work will be even larger. Um, question from uh, uh, Chicago Public Schools. Has there been any discussion on Saga expanding to upper grades? And what has been the impact on the overall teacher practices at schools where you are implementing? I'll take that one too. So we've done work in grades, in math, in grades 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. We've done work in grade 1 literacy, too. Where we're going to go on, the, on our math uh, piece of work, which is our core competency, is down. So we're mainly in, in ninth grade algebra 1 now. We're in 10th grade geometry, mainly across the country. We're going to go down to grades 6, 7, and 8. And we've had interest from districts for us to do that. We're building out the curriculum for that. And next fall, not this fall, but the fall of 22, we'll be ready to add grades 6 and 7 to our grade nine and 10 directly run soccer program. But going up in grades, I don't think is uh, in, the near, in the next three years planned for us. The impact on the overall teaching practices, we don't know. I mean, it'd be a, an interesting study. What we see is when teachers have free periods, they love to sit in our room. And you know, I've been in, uh, in schools where a teacher gives a, a student a note saying, please work with your tutor on this when you have your tutoring period. It can be that micro uh, collaboration between teacher through student to tutor. 
we have teachers sitting in the room saying, wow, the kids in soccer are, be are behaving differently from when they're in my class of 25. And that's one of the, obviously the secret sauces here is that you change the place, the, the setting for education changes how kids show up. Kids show up in a tutorial much more willing to, to reveal what they don't know than in a class of 20 of over 30, where it can be embarrassing to either uh, be the student who answers every question or the student who can't answer any question. So in a tutorial, in the, in the relative privacy of tutorial, kids, I think, show uh, their true selves, which is kids who are eager to learn and eager to build a relationship with an adult. Uh, question about um, what is the time period you aim to have a local education agency commit to a partnership with Saga Get the best results and does that timeline need to be extended uh, given the pandemic's impact so in our direct program where we say to a city look we're interested in coming there let's talk about all the issues that are involved and we think there are seven major major issues districts need to consider as they consider bringing in a program like saga we've given them a deadline of april 1st even in this year because it takes time once that go no go decision is reached for us to source the talent we need being this, a leader of the city ideally a person who's worked in the city or even in the city school district we need to source the, the, the room leaders who are our school site directors, often former teachers. We need to source the tutors. We need to build a program. And we need to do that in the spring when we can work with the school's programmer to schedule kids. We can work with the teachers and the parents and get communication out. This program is coming. So April 1st is really a deadline that we take seriously in terms of running a high fidelity program. Now, in terms of Saga supporting districts that are not going to bring Saga in, it's a branded program, but want to consult with us to help them answer those seven key questions and take some deep dive with them on, on some specific issues, we can do that at any time. And we're building out a practice to be able to respond uh, to the national demand for that, that we know is, is starting to come our way. So that's the answer to that question. And um, another question came in, what lessons from this year of virtual tutoring will impact your model going forward? Um, AJ, you want to uh, start an answer to that? What lessons from virtual tutoring might impact our model in the future? I mean, at Saga Education, we always knew that online tutoring may change the way we think about um, high impact tutoring in the long term. So even before the pandemic and so before the pandemic, we had the opportunity to work closely with College Board um, as part of a virtual SAT tutoring pilot in partnership with NORC. And that was also part of a randomized control research study to see if we can help students reach a critical college readiness benchmark on the SAT. And, and as part of that work, it was online. And that's when we met the Woot Math team for the first time. And they built a custom platform specifically designed for high quality uh, instruction and, and tutoring that we use to facilitate the, the, the work. And I, uh, I can't share the the results right now because that belongs to a college board but what we can say is that uh, the results from that were really strong really encouraging and uh, that was um, enough for us to know that we can maintain um, our instructional objectives online um, and so when the pandemic um, arrived we're able to pivot and utilize and leverage those resources that we developed during that time period with respect to training and the online platform to maintain instructional continuity for students. Thanks, AJ. Question uh, from uh, Toronto. What do students give up when doing daily tutoring during school time? Related to the question, do you do tutoring outside of the regular school day? Maybe even after school, other non-instructional times or at lunch? So I think it differs by, by a grade level. High school students, uh, it's usually is taking the place of an elective period. Usually, it's not always the case. In middle school, it's usually scheduled by cohorts. So you may have a middle school grade, say grade six, 150 kids, six sections of 25. Section one would have the regular math class, the regular English class, then the tutoring class. Section two would have the tutoring period, the math class, the English class. So it's scheduled as a cohort throughout the day. And the elementary grades, uh, when we did grade one literacy, really was a pullout from, in this case, literacy on the teacher's um, guided reading time. So we took out half the kids. The teacher had uh, fewer small groups to work with in guided reading, while our tutors tutored those kids in a one on two ratio during that time. So it differs uh, in terms of different grade levels. And um, would we do it in a different time of day? I don't think we would. We, you know, we've done, when I ran the match school, um, we did a program after school on Saturdays. You know, there's a, there's a culture of a school that you can take advantage of when you're built as part of the school day. It's not a stigma. It's not competing with extracurriculars or kids at high school level who have jobs or have to take care of their siblings. It's part of the regular school day. It's part of the regular diet. We think that makes it more routine, less of a stigma. It's what kids get. It's, 
you know, one of our principals in Chicago now retired, uh, Latanya, you probably remember her, Ramona Fanning's outlaw from Harlem, said as she would walk the halls of the school after we'd been there, the kids who had Saga were coming up to her, being more excited, more confident. Kids who were not in Saga were coming up to her and saying, how come we're not in it? So the culture of a school can change if it's part of the day. The opportunity for the culture of the school changing, I think, is much higher than if it were after school, quite possibly an after school afterthought, you know, where there's no connection to teachers, there's no real communication between the school and the tutor. Part of the day, you can have that close connection because tutoring is to support teaching. It's not to replace teaching. It's to support teaching, to personalize in ways that every teacher would dream of doing, but in a class of 25 or a four or five, six classes of 25 in the day, and the heterogeneity of those classes is just impossible except for the superhuman teacher to personalize for every one of the kids that he or she teaches. Tutoring is the supplement to that, trying to accomplish something that education should be designed to do, which is to provide personalized learning and teaching kids at the right level. And uh, see uh, a few more uh, questions here, and then we'll wrap up in about two minutes. Um, so Monica, I know you um, have studied our literacy results. If you take a moment on that, I'd love to hear what you have to say about the uh, literacy work. Sure. Um, so there's been a couple questions about um, work in elementary schools. We did a small pilot across uh, two charter schools in Chicago public schools on the west side, um, looking at Saga's model, um, but working with first graders in literacy. Um, and what we find are comparable effects. So that model was a little bit different because uh, you had 20 students in a literacy block, and then half of them were working with the Saga tutors, which meant that instead of 20 students left over, there were 10 students left over in the literacy block. And so the teachers actually had a smaller class size to work with, so they benefited as well. But we still see um, uh, statistically significant uh, effects on standardized test scores and literacy um, for the young kids. And we're looking, you know, we've been following them long term to, again, look at this um, question of fade out. And so we hope to share those results um, you know, soon more broadly, but uh, the analysis to date suggests that the effects are still comparable, um, which to me seems like it's the model. It's not, it's not something unique to math in ninth grade or high school students. It's the model and those effects hold across content and age and, you know, geography, for example. So we've done some work in, in New York public schools as well. Thanks, Martha. Latanya, you get the next to last word. You had an answer about how it's scheduled in CPS. Yeah, so in CPS, the question was, you know, what do, what do students, um, you know, miss as a result of uh, participating? And in CPS, our high schools schedule it as a, a course um, within the regular course schedule. Uh, many of them identify it as math lab, so they're not missing something as a result. Um, it would be similar to taking an elective, which they could always take um, at any other time during their high school career. So they don't, there's no trade-off. I want to thank uh, Latanya so much for you being able to stay with us this entire call. You're, you're such a hero for the kids of Chicago, and you're such a great partner for us. I want to thank Monica and John uh, from the Urban Labs for your research and your uh, stick to itness uh, through all these uh, years that we've been working together. I thank Krista Marks for leading our products team. I want to thank AJ Gutierrez, uh, whom I've known since he was 14 years old as a freshman at the Match High School that I used to run, and how great it is to the feeling that an um, educator has when a student comes back and says, look, I want to I want to work for kids like myself in a big way because what was done on, on his behalf has, has made a difference in his life. And the challenge I have to all of you who are participating, take a look at our website, sign up on the address on the screen. It's also in the chat so you can get notified when that portal is up. That portal will be a tremendous support for districts. We need to publicize it. And with your help, we'll get the word out and, and pre-service training can take a major leap forward with the Saga Education Saga Coach portal. Thank you so much. And uh, we wish you well. Stay healthy.